What's going on, everybody? My name is Stephen Heider. My co-host to the right, other direction here, <laughs> is Hunter Doyle. Together, we form the Analytically Incorrect podcast. Hunter, how are you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm excited to talk some Eagles football now after the uh, the whole QB carousel and, and drafts the start to the podcast that we got. <laughs> so tonight's topic, or today's topic, whenever you guys get around to watching this, <laughs> We want to talk about how you improve the Philadelphia Eagles football team. I think we all know that it's really hard to project the draft without kind of knowing the plans for free agency. I'll just open up by saying, Hunter, my opinion of how you approach things is you try to shore up your team to the best of your ability in the offseason, free agency in particular, and then you kind of draft best player available at how you grade and value positions in terms of the draft. Uh, how do you see this going? Like, Hunter, what, what do you think they're going to do? Like, how, what is your philosophy? Does your philosophy differ from mine anyway? No, I, I've been – so So I think in previous years I've looked kind of at the draft as position groups. Um, over the past two years, I'd say it shifted to the best player available mentality. Like you said, it, the free agency comes first. That's something you have to address and you have to, you know, see what you can get with the money you have, and then you kind of address the rest of the best in the in the draft there. For example, I know – a lot of people aren't a fan of tripling down on receiver, but there's a couple guys in the first round that if they're on the board, you do have to consider them because they're probably going to be the best player on the board. So um, I'm definitely a best player available guy um, no matter what happens. And I, I think there's a round where we're picking, especially in the first round, I think there's going to be a lot of best players available. <laughs> 100%. Now, what I will say is, is I think it gets complex when you get into – where does the team need to be strengthened? And I'll start off right from the beginning of talking defensively because I got a feeling a lot of us are going to come to the consensus that the offense still needs pieces. It's still a couple of players away from really being something that we can write home about, if you will. But the defense is, in my opinion, the thing that at times really shines and at times you can really, really see the deficiencies within it. And I'll start off with, I don't think our pass rush was bad. I think we get pressure. I think we knock quarterbacks off their mark. I think we get quarterback hits. We don't complete plays. And some of that has to do with the marriage between coverage and pass rush. And there are times where the pass rush fell flat and put the coverage in a bad position. But far too often, especially early in the season, basically the coverage was backed off so much that teams were just able to easily adjust and say, look, ball's out of your hands within 2.6 seconds ball needs to be out of your hands take what's given let's drive the field and we'll take our shots in the red zone score on this team as you sit here do you think there's any player you can you can plug in and insert that fixes this problem or do you think this is a hey jonathan gannon you've had one year to get your play calling your your scheme and and the way the core components of what you do together now it's time to to fine tune it here like how do you see the bigger issue here do you think it was personnel that Gannon didn't trust the personnel early or do you think it was just kind of a young coach getting his foot you know kind of getting his feet under him if you will Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think I'm gonna give a boring answer I think it's a little bit of both I think that too many times he just gives slot receivers or slot tight ends free releases at the line and then you you saw that in the box game every time you saw that Brady took the free completion that was right there Um, not really much disguise pre-snap post-snap at times i um, not saying every single game, but I'd like to see a little bit more of that. But, you know, I, I think that it's a little bit of both. I think if you give Jonathan Gannon um, a, a couple, you know, maybe one or two more edge rushers, maybe a young guy in the draft, maybe you give him a, a general at linebacker. No offense to TJ Edwards. I thought he had a really good year, but you can definitely upgrade that position. And then you give him, you know, the system he wants to run with two high safeties. You give him a couple safeties who can come down and fill the run even from a too high spot. Um, rather than you know the, the couple guys we had last year who couldn't really necessarily do that at a high enough level. So I, I think there's definitely blame the dish out on his end, but I think the personnel absolutely limited what he was able to do on that side of the ball. See, I, I think you're getting into some some very technical territory here, which I agree with you on, which is, you know, we talk about pass rush and the interior pass rush at times was, in, it was pretty good. I, I mean, Javon Hargrave early on on the film was just absolutely destructive. That guy's hand placement and what he did to guards was, it was really impressive to see the film behind what he was doing. 
But what I will say is, is that teams kind of figured it out. They started moving their quarterbacks. They started speeding up the progressions of the quarterbacks. And I felt like the outside pass rush never quite got to the level we wanted it to be. And we did a lot of things to try to, you know, help that along. You know, we, we did a lot of five man fronts, a lot of, you know, basically I wouldn't call it a bare front because you're not covering both guards and the center normally, but we did a lot of five man fronts there, whether it was Eagle, no matter what it was, we, we definitely brought some five man front action there with Jannard Avery. The problem is, is it just felt like, you know, there were times where Derek Barnett got home with a bull rush, but I didn't see the arsenal of pass rush moves that should be on a guy that's going on to his fifth year in the league. I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that development, which I think, there are moments in time where Derek Barnett looks like the real deal. And there's moments in times where, you know, he looks like a you know, quasi pass rusher in the NFL. Uh, Josh Sweat has a tremendous, you know, athletic profile. You can see that there are times where teams can just do nothing to stop him. You know, there's a lot of chipping, a lot of usage of, of your tight ends and your running backs, trying to make sure that he didn't get singled up one-on-one on a tackle to, to basically embarrass them with speed to power. But with that said, I mean, I didn't see a lot of layering of the pass rush. And what we mean by layering is is a good way of keeping a quarterback from easily sliding up into the pocket or out of the pocket is to layer your pass rush. So somebody goes a little shallow in the pass rush, somebody else goes high, which it's not impossible to move up into the pocket or to move out of the pocket, but it becomes a little more difficult to do so. And teams mm-hmm. like the New Orleans Saints and their defensive line are very good at layering their pass rush moves. I didn't see a ton of that on the film from Philadelphia. Uh, like, what are your thoughts about this general kind of topic here? Mm-hmm. I think you hit the nail on the head with Barnett. Look, I, he came into the league, and I think a big thing that we talked about when he was drafted, at least me even at a young age remembers this, was that he just kind of won with his athleticism around the edge and, and just being able to you know get by guys in college, which – You know, SEC, you're you're still going to have to be pretty impressive to do what he did. I mean, that's not to take away and say every single time it was just athleticism and bend. But like you said, you know, he he did have a pretty high pass rush win rate because of that bull rush. But outside of that, there's just times where you just see him get stalled up, kind of like we saw with Kerrigan at times this year, too, which is a whole nother story. He's kind of past his prime. But um, and yeah, as far as sweat goes, the bend around the edge was really incredible. Um, that, that's something that I, I think is going to, you know, at least keep him around six to eight sacks a year moving forward. You know, he's going to have to, you know, build some more, build some more moves into his arsenal, but um, he he has the the bend and the dip to be able to, to win at least um, kind of go in those hot streaks he goes on. And I think the thing with sweat I love too is, you know, this is kind of a little less technical, but the the moments in the game where he's able to come through are massive. I mean, this guy comes through in the fourth quarter, late down the stretch, um, late, late in the season too. So, um, yeah, those guys, I think, you know, there's pros and cons, but, um, I don't expect Barnett to be back. And I think there's definitely a lot, a lot of work to be done at the edge position. You know, you don't know what Brandon Graham's going to look like. I hope he looks the same because one of those guys who's good at stopping the run and rushing the passer, which I think we need a little bit more of. I think sweat's getting better at it, but, um, I I think that's something we need a little bit of work on too. And, um, I don't know. I want to hear your thoughts on this too. Like, what do you kind of think of a guy, like guys like Patrick Johnson and Jannard Avery, like upgrading from them and, and kind of this, it's kind of a little bit of a different topic, but the Sam linebacker position there and how they kind of factor into the pass rush. That's a great question because the role of the Sam linebacker in the system is a little complex to where maybe that guy plays 60 to 70% of your snaps. But even looking at a guy like Anthony Barr, who has familiarity in our system, he's a veteran guy. He is an incrementally better pass rusher than those guys are. With that said, you know, you're, you're talking about a guy that only played like 60 some snaps of Minnesota's, you know, on their defense, especially in, in pass coverage, man coverage in particular. He got pulled out when they got into man situations. So with that said, I, I do wonder about the, you know, applicability of that player in that position group and, you know, in terms of getting it precedence in off in the off season and in, in, in terms of free agency and what you do there. I think that it's complex, right? Because how much money are you going to spend on that? How important is it to your, to your defensive line? These are things I don't know because I don't know that we have fully seen what Jonathan Gannon had envisioned for the defense. And if just inserting a guy would do that. Here's my real question. A lot of the um, linebackers that, that I see that I think are worth going after, right? A lot of those guys are kind of wills. They're either wills that might have some ability to play the mic. 
but they're probably not Sam's. So could you take a guy like Davion Taylor, who's a little bit bigger, certainly fast, certainly has the athletic profile. You know, he can set the edge and run support. He kind of showed that this year. And could you flip him from the will to the Sam maybe, and then maybe go after one of those will backers in free agency to kind of help you shore things up. Or is your answer really just upgrading the Mike position with TJ Edwards, which, you know, it's hard to say because I really, I'm a really big fan of TJ Edwards. And I think he's just been really above what was advertised. He's, you know, he's not the fastest 40 guy, but if you look at his lateral movements, sideline to sideline, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I'm very pleased at what those numbers were. I mean, he ranks higher than what a lot of people would realize in in that ability. His run defense is next level. I don't know that you're going to find too many upgrades over him in run defense. And in zone pass coverage, he knows how to read the quarterback's eyes. He's a former safety. He gets how to get the, the correct depth and how to read. It's just, man, it's it's when it's more of a, you're, we're no longer moving lateral anymore. We're no longer using good hip sync. We're no longer using necessarily your your understanding of depth and eyes. Now we're using your physical abilities to move, run, you know, forward and backwards and a little bit more of the vertical stuff to it. That's where I think he gets himself in trouble. So I don't know what the answer is there, to be honest with you, you Hunter. I mean, I could see multiple ways the Eagles could approach something like this, but I'm not 100% certain what it is yet. I mean, do you have a preference for how you would want to resolve the linebacker position? Yeah, no, I, I think, like you said, the will position is something – look, Alex Singleton was really not the same. I mean, I know he wasn't anything crazy 2020, but we saw flashes, and then this year just wasn't really the same at all. He had some Nathan Gary numbers up there if you go on PFF. <laughs> That's not something you want to touch. But, like you know, like you said, I like Davion a lot. I've thought about him potentially pass rushing before, too. I think he, you know, is starting to develop those instincts. And maybe if he's kind of caught up to speed, maybe you throw a little more at him and, and play him at that same position. And like you said, I think TJ Edwards, just kind of the leadership role he took up on that defense, too. Um, with, you know, they got rid of Eric Wilson after a few weeks there at the start of the season, which was a disaster. Thought he would be a guy who would at least give you some familiarity with Gannon's scheme didn't really perform very well. So they bring, you know, ship him off, bring in Edwards. And yeah, his leadership was really impressive. And even like, like you said, better than advertised, that goes back even to, you know, week 16 of his rookie year for TJ Edwards against Dallas. When I believe he was in on one of the stops where we got Ezekiel Elliott, the fumble, and we were playing with the practice squad that game, you know, and you see the strides he's made in pass coverage. You know, I think, I think a thing that I've always said is he makes up for the lack of athleticism with, his eye discipline and just the football IQ he has. Um, and I honestly like his 40 time too. Um, I believe he was a little banged up, but I definitely think you can tell he plays faster than that at this point. So um, I, I think that Edwards, I definitely think, you know, you survey the market and look to see if you can upgrade there. Cause I think there are better players, but um, I would agree with you, you know, kind of looking at it in context that the other two spots are probably more important. And I think, Looking at the guys in the draft, they like you said, like a Devin Lloyd, a you know Nicobe Dean. I think they kind of fit more, one of the outside spots a little bit more so than Edwards playing the mic. Yeah, I think Nicobe Dean, you you might be able to play him as a mic. Uh, Devin Lloyd to me is definitely an outside linebacker. He probably could play the mic sure. if you absolutely needed it, but you know he's probably more so a Will or a Sam to be quite honest. And, and that gets complex too, right? Because we're talking about first round evaluations do you spend a first round pick on a Sam linebacker? Right. That's, that's the other side to it. <laughs> and, and that's where things get a little complicated when you're talking about evaluating the position group. Cause a lot of people just say like, go with the best man available. And it's like, I get you. I hear you. What if that guy's only going to play 60% of your snaps and you've drafted him in the first round, not only in the first round, but potentially in the top half of the first round for mm-hmm. 16 picks could be a bad look. You know, uh, people might lose context of, the way we use Sam linebackers, you know, that, that I think it could kind of complex there. Now I do think that if you're looking at Nicobe Dean, if you put him at the Mike linebacker, he's a guy that probably it's not the greatest coverage guy. I think Devin Lloyd gives you a little bit more coverage ability than he does to be quite honest, but he can cover, you know, he can cover. He's very athletically gifted. He probably could be a three down linebacker and you're looking at a, you know, a guy that's going to play your mic. So I, I, I could see that one. It, it makes more sense there. No doubt about it, but it, Hard to say, man. Like nothing is as easy as people like to pretend. And I'll give you another one. Another guy that I love in free agency. Kaiser White from the Chargers. 
former, you know, strong safety that was converted into a linebacker, probably 220 if you, you know, soak him with the hose before you put him on the scale with his pads on. But the young man is very physical against the run. He doesn't give up because of his size. Like, I mean, he's got the mentality of a strong safety that will come up and, and, and hit. And he's fantastic in coverage. He can play man coverage. He's a really good man coverage linebacker, probably because he's really a safety playing linebacker. That's a guy that if you're really going to move Davion Taylor to the Sam, I would love to plug Kaiser White in as a will with TJ Edwards and Davion Taylor and just kind of see where, where things went from a free agency perspective. Devondre Campbell gives you the same kind of thing you could do, but Devondre Campbell will cost you probably a lot more than Kaiser White will. Um, <laughs> Devondre Campbell, though, is, is a veteran, and I think that he would change – he's one of these guys where the leadership would be valued alongside of the actual physical play in his athleticism, because that is a very young linebacking core. It's there's not a ton of experience. There's not a ton of age there. I mean, I mean, think about it. Alex Singleton is probably the oldest guy in that room, mm. even older than the coach. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah <Rallis. laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's definitely something, you know, to that about bringing in a veteran leader. That's why I don't rule out Anthony Barr, but show me the contract because, that could become complicated giving him a big contract, even though he knows the system, he knows the scheme. He's definitely a guy that if you freed him up and let him just kind of do his thing and disrupt the pass rush or disrupt the quarterback with his pass rush, certainly he could be effective, but 60, 65% of your snaps, you know what I mean? Like that, that could be, com- you know, could be conflict. There could be a potential issue with, with that and trying to sell that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that, that kind of worries me here about the way that you fit some of these guys. But mm-hmm. I want to flip the conversation a little bit, and let's get to the um, the secondary for a moment. Let's talk a little bit about what we were referencing earlier, which is coverage. And more so, the cushions we were affording wide receivers early in, in the season. And you mentioned about free releases being given to the slot receivers and to the tight ends. And what's really funny is, is that the bigger name tight ends did not eat us up. Yeah. But these guys that might be a little lesser known had big, big games against us. Partner. How important do you think it is to to stop these slot receivers and tight ends on our defense? Because they seem to really be the the catalyst and the focus of moving the football on us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have you obviously have Avante Maddox there who can, um, you know, he he's definitely had a great year and he's an above average slot corner. I think we all wanted to move to the slot, and I think that's something that helps. But I heard a lot of people talking about just manning him up on Gronk before the Bucks game. Um, I, I'm not sure where that idea got floated around. I was personally never a fan of that, but I think point being there is, you know, you kind of touched on it. Like I said, Donald Parham, that was one of the names who I, I remember one of those backup tight ends who had a field day against us. I think when we played the chargers, he had a couple big catches, a couple big touchdowns. I think guys like that, it, I'm, you know, and, and this goes back, you know, past couple of years, I feel like, you know, against the Rams a few times, the Saints, you know, the Saints had a couple backup tight ends eat us up back in 2018, I think. That's going back a while ago. But I don't think you have these guys who can really, you know, match up right now. And obviously, Gannon, I don't know if he wants to go. You know, we don't really know a ton about uh, – I think we need to learn a little bit more about his scheme. But um, I, I don't know if you have guys, even if you wanted to go man coverage more often that, you can just man up. But um, I think you you still need guys who can kind of bracket and just take away space from these, these tight ends and make it a little bit more difficult on them. And I think that – I think a lot of that goes to the safety position too. And, and, you know, linebacker will help with that for sure. But um, I think that, I think the safety position is a little bit more like a bigger need than um, a lot of people are kind of making it out to me. Not that I think Eagles fans are kind of prioritizing it, but um, I, I do think it's a pretty significant need because of, you know, the coverage as we talked about, but also the run game too. Fair point. And to add to that, what you were saying, you know, Keenan Allen is also a guy who plays a ton in this, in the, inside the slot, exactly. they using out of the backfield he did a lot in that game to kind of nickel and dime us, dime us with him, which was, you know, just kept converting, kept moving the sticks on us because of that. Um, he brought up a really good point, which is talking about safety play and the fact that it's it's probably the more important position to upgrade at is at the safety position. Number one, because, you know, there's really outside of Marcus Epps, who are you going to point to as a useful guy that can play? I mean, Kavon Wallace – I had high hopes for, but it never materialized yet. So I don't know what he is at the NFL level. It's just we haven't had a big enough sample size to grade it. At this point, I would say that I'm concerned. Now, I definitely think this is that's the position group where 
I feel like you should probably really, really pay attention to free agency and maybe even overspend to go get a guy that can give you good play. Cause I think that that's a spot where you can get a Marcus Williams. <sighs> maybe I overspend for that guy, you know, Jesse Bates, if somehow Cincinnati allows him to really hit free agency, I'd probably overspend a little bit for him. You know, even Eric Reed, who didn't have a great statistical year, but we know the athletic profile, him and, and Epps paired together would be one heck of an athletic tandem at safety. Just the, the way those two guys could cover ground would be incredible to watch. I think you have to get better at safety. I, I don't think it's an option for the Eagles. I think if we maintain passive and don't do anything in free agency, don't do anything in the draft, I think you got a big problem when you're hand for this defense. I mean, what are your overall thoughts about the players you would like to see targeted? The ways that you, you know, how important you think this position group is. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Like you said, those, those are really a couple of good names and I'll throw another one out there. I think he's coming off of an injury, which is tough, but um, I think just because of Darius Slay's recruiting ability, this one could be likely as Quadre Diggs, who um, I believe was on the Seahawks the, the past year. A guy, we, we've seen the flashes of him the past few years, not just flashes, you know, some consistent play too. Um, I'll be honest, didn't watch him a ton this year, but just kind of understanding, you know, knowing the the kind of profile he has, I think, from the past is definitely something, someone you can kind of bring in um, and, and expect to get, at least, at least I think you'll get improved play there. Um, I, I think that's the worst case scenario is you get improved play from what you had this year. You know, I don't think Anthony Harris, I don't think he'll be back. Um, I, I probably prefer he doesn't come back. Um, and McLeod, I mean, I, I could see him kind of taking a team friendly deal. I won't be surprised because of the relationship he has with the team, but I, I think there's, like you said, Marcus Epps is really the only guy who I think is going to have a case for being one of the three safeties who kind of is getting playing time. Kevon Wallace is a special teamer at this point at best too. Um, so yeah, like you said, Marcus Williams, obviously known for, you know, the Stefan Diggs play, but has had a really, really good career. And, and in New Orleans, you know, again, Dennis Allen, really good defensive mastermind over there obviously is now the head coach i think that's someone you know he played under dennis allen for a bunch of years now i think that's someone who you'd like to kind of add to your defense to get some get kind of an iq iq boost as well and i think someone who can kind of survey things back there and make a lot of decisions and help the other guys out too um, by communicating well so i i really like marcus williams and i'm definitely kind of interested to see if quadre Diggs is a guy who they target in free agency yeah, I, I think you're right. You just you need a let's just call it a marketable improvement at safety. I mean, and it's no shot because I, I thought that as the season went on and you saw McLeod get a little bit more healthier, there was better play there. I mean, he definitely came on towards the end of the season. And I don't hate resigning McLeod. I just wouldn't stop there. I think you need more than just that move in particular. Now, outside corner. I think the easy solution here would just be, okay, you know, bring Steven Nelson back. Bring him back. But the thing is, is I don't know how the rest of the league is going to perceive his play. I thought that it's a little overhyped. Personally, I thought his play is a little overhyped, and teams did pick on him a little bit, to be quite honest, especially when they could get him matched up in, in a man situation. Gannon seemed to really be concerned towards the early and middle part of the year about his coverage abilities and was really giving teams an unjustified, you know, blank. Well, not a blanket, but even pushing afforded to the receivers on his side. Towards the end of the year, they brought him down around the line of scrimmage. He got more physical and the play improved drastically. I still think that he's, you know, him and Slay are still, you know, fought them all we want, talk all we want about them, but those two guys together still formed a really, really good core. I'm not opposed to bringing them back. It's just a matter of the money. How much money do you spend on a guy like this? If you could bring Steven Nelson back. Would you bring him back while still looking in the draft clearly? But also, would you maybe would you maybe go for a plan B? Would you maybe let Steven Nelson go on that contract, knowing that he's probably going to get more money than we should probably pay him? And just wait to see if that doesn't materialize and then come back around in the secondary market? Or would you target a guy like maybe a Levi Wallace or somebody else that's kind of a CB number two that might give you maybe, maybe a little bit more than what you got from Steve Nelson? Like, how would you personally kind of attack that cornerback room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually just looking at Levi Wallace's uh, projected market value on uh, SpotRack, I believe it was. So I think he's expected an average annual salary around around 9.6, 9.6 million, I believe. 
Um, so definitely a little, probably going to be a little pricier than Steven Nelson. But again, like you said, I think you said it perfectly. We don't know how everyone else perceives Steven Nelson's play because it was kind of up and down at times. There were, there were times where he made plays and then there were times where, you know, in the Raiders game where Carr takes a shot deep and then the deep ball that Nelson gives up is in a sense, a, a, almost a turning point. Um, and then there's the touchdown he gives up against the giants in the first giants game, you know, it's little things like that. I think it's just, for me, looking back at the cornerbacks we've had before Steven Nelson, whether, you know, Nolan Carroll, lead us, McKelvin, Bradley Fletcher, Kerry Williams, he's such a serviceable option that I think that's kind of, that's kind of why he's a little bit overhyped too. Um, it, that definitely kind of helps his perception a little bit, but you know, I think, I don't know if he'll get massively overpaid by another team, but I, I do agree with you. I think some other team is going to, you know, maybe spend a little bit more because there's other teams that need a CB1, uh, you know, who's on Steven Nelson's level. Um, whereas we're, we're looking at him as kind of CB2 and probably not going to be able to pay him as much or want to pay him as much as another team might want to. So I, I would love to bring him back if he wants to come back and, and play on, you know, a fair contract. I'm bringing him back, but I, I think I'm also – you know, in my mind right now, if I'm the Eagles, I'm definitely preparing for, for another option. I think the draft is a good way to not not solidify that, but I think even if Steven Nelson comes back, the draft is a good way to kind of get, you know, your, your future guy hopefully locked down there. So to round out tonight's conversation, I'll just ask you a really easy round out question. We're sitting in the first round. We have three picks, assuming, assuming we don't trade anything away. What are the position groups that you could see defensively the Eagles spending the 15th, 16th, or 19th pick on? I'll go first because I, I think it's pretty easy to define, in my opinion. I think it's defensive line. I don't know that there's a defensive tackle that's going to go quite that high, but combine hasn't happened yet. Dudes can rise. Defensive end in particular, I, I could see. I think that a corner is a very, very likely situation with three picks in the first round. And then safety. I do think that that's where you could get a guy that might rise up the boards to that 19th pick, you know, uh, Lewis scene, you know, I'm thinking about guys like that. Jaquan Brisker. So someone else mm -hmm. is going to probably rise their way and, and be in consideration. Is it too early to draft them? Probably so. Probably so. But just the position group of need we need, it fits. Those are the three that I look at personally. I'm not opposed to taking a linebacker. I still think a linebacker is, can be very useful, like I said, though, it's just when you break down the playing time and the way we use our linebackers, if you're talking about a Sam linebacker, I think it's a tough sell. Um, what are your thoughts? How do you see that kind of situation working its way out? I'm the exact same. <laughs> same three positions right there. There's always a few edge guys who are going to be around that range. I know Jermaine Johnson's been thrown around. I haven't gotten a chance to watch him, but I could very well, you know, you know how he loves to build in the trenches and i I think that's a very real possibility. We're around that 14 range where we picked Barnett. Um, yeah, as far as corner goes, there are some dudes there. You know, I, I know I, I think Sauce Gardner might rise a little bit, but if there's any chance we can grab a guy like that, that's that's my dream pick out of these three positions. I love Sauce Gardner. And then, yeah, safety. Like you said, guys rise when the combine comes. Obviously, now we have the info. The combine will be unbubbled. So that means we're going to get, you know, actual measurements and everything, whereas the pro days – can be a little bit different sometimes. So, um, you know, we're going to have a better idea of where these guys are going to go um, in a few months. And I agree with you. I think there's definitely, you know, Brisker, I think there's a good chance he could rise for sure. Um, maybe I'm being a little biased Penn State, but I, I think there's a good chance he could rise. There's one more name I kind of left out of there, which is the uh, Michigan. I don't know if he's a safety. I don't know if he's a nickel. And I, and I think that's where it's going to come down to is, how does a team perceive him? Because as a nickel corner, you're probably not going in the top 20. But if teams do perceive him as a safety at the next level, then you add a name to that one. You definitely add a name there. But what I want to state here, guys, is that I'm not saying that these guys can't play the will and that the will linebacker, especially a guy like, you know, you know, you look at a guy like Devin Lloyd who can clearly cover. It's just do the Eagles – are they are the Eagles going to move, you know, are the Eagles going to move Davion Taylor? or are they ready to, are they ready to, to put an upgrade over Davion Taylor? I think that's where things get complicated with the linebacker room. But with that said, guys, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in. This was our defensive discussion. The next time we meet guys, we are going to talk offense, offensive fits, how to improve the offense, free agency and the draft. 
What I will say, guys, is I have built a guide. I will link it down below. Just follow the link that you see there. And I went over five free agent options at linebacker because I probably just ticked a lot of you guys off by saying I'm removing dudes off my board at linebacker. It's not that I'm completely removing them. I need to know the fit, guys. That's what I'm saying. Is that, Am I looking at this dude as a Sam? Am I looking at him as a Mike? Is this going to be the Will? Where is Davion Taylor factor in? I'm just trying to add complexity to the decision, guys. But that is linked down below, guys. So it'll be inside of a Google Docs form. It's it's a PDF that I, I put into a Google Doc. So just follow the link down below, guys, and you can get that guide. Um, I dug pretty deep for us because I knew I was going to have this conversation. and I knew I was going to you know, drag Hunter into something he had no clue I was taking things to. So don't blame Hunter. It's all me. <laughs> but uh, we, re we really do appreciate you guys tuning in with us. Hunter, I appreciate you, buddy, man. Thank you so much for coming on and, and talking some football tonight. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you having me on as always. I appreciate the, uh, the impromptu questions too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you all so much. We will see you guys on Friday's episode where we're going to go over and we're going to talk a little bit more about the offensive fits and, and free agency. And then we'll add in a little bit about the draft. All right, guys. Thank you all so much. We'll see you on the next episode, guys. Peace.